Well, hey there, everyone, and welcome to our podcast. This episode was recorded in our adult Sunday school class and features our longtime teacher, Miss Jeannie. We hope you enjoy this teaching. Now, let's get into the lesson. All right, y'all, let's get going. We got a lot of ground to cover this morning, and I want to cover it. I hope we cover it. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six pages of notes. I want to cover at least two. I want to cover at least two. Oh. Thank you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Now, if y'all been around me that long, you know that when I cry, my contacts get dirty and then I can't hear. Please don't make me cry. Thank y'all very much. I appreciate. I really do appreciate it. Uh, you know how you have expectations of what you're going to look like on a certain birthday? Well, I thought I was going to get up this morning and be skinny. <laughs> and I went and told Ted, I said, it didn't happen. And Ted said, you didn't work on it. <laughs> hey. Y'all might not like that comment. I love being married to somebody that's honest. <laughs> right? I love it. I love friends that are cut and dried. I like people who will say what they think. Amen? They don't hurt my feelings. They help me grow. Now, I'm not talking about not in love. I know Ted loves me. But Ted was being truthful with me this morning. Truth is love. God is love. And God is perfect truth. And it didn't hurt my feelings because the truth is Ted and I are both overweight and we're working on it together and we know we didn't work on it yesterday because we got Chinese yesterday and we know we didn't work on it yesterday so all he's trying to do is what? Encourage me to keep what? To keep working on keep going. As Christians, if we would get in the habit with our brothers and sisters in the Lord instead of pretending like they don't have a problem, when they talk to us about a problem, we need to be okay with that they have a problem and love on them and keep encouraging them, right? Not, oh, yo, you're fine. No. Jesus didn't tell the Sadducees and Pharisees they were fine. Jesus didn't tell the people there was more than one way to heaven. Did He? We need to be in the habit with one of His, and I'm talking about in love. We need to be in the habit of being lovingly truthful with each other. Amen? And that's going to be part of our lesson this morning. That's going to be part of our lesson about being truthful. I want you, how many of you know that we need to gather together? Father God, we give you glory and honor and praise this morning. We thank you, Father. We thank you that we can come together. Father, we are blessed. Not only can we come together, but we come together with food in our bellies. We come together, Father, with a song in our hearts. We come, Father, to a place that's air-conditioned. We thank You, Father, for Your blessings that You give us that are new and fresh to us every morning. Father, the person who is financially the worst off in this room this morning is more blessed than 45 to 50% of the people in this nation. And Father, help us to realize that You bless us that you honor us, Father. We love you, Father. We love you. We love you. Father, we pray for those that are in need this morning. We pray for the Nellan family this morning, Father, for the Nellan family. We pray for that family, Father, this morning and the hurting people that are dealing with the loss of these precious singers. Father, we pray for those that could not be here this morning because of sickness. We ask that you heal them and lift them up. Father, we pray this morning for the unknown, the one that's hurting, and feels alone. Father, put their name on our lips. Help us to be the person that will say, yes, I'll go. Yes, I'll do. Yes, I'll sit with a friend. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Go to the book of Psalms, if you will. Psalms chapter 50. We're going to be in the Psalms uh, for a couple more weeks. We're going to be in the Psalms. We're studying Psalms that David did not write, that are not credited to David. We know this one, the book of uh, Psalms in verse 50, uh, it gives and says who wrote it. It says the Psalm of Asaph. 
Now, we, we know a little bit about Asaph. Y'all study Asaph this week. A little bit about him. But how many of you know that songs can be prophetic? Amen. That a song can be prophetic. That a song could be for the time it was written. And then going forward, a song can be for the time of now. How many of you at some point in your life has the song How Great Thou Art been very meaningful to you? Very, very meaningful to you. The song How Great Thou Art. How many of you Amazing Grace? Very meaningful. How many of you have had a rainbow appear at the perfect time? Amen. How many of you have ever been to the funeral of somebody that you dearly loved and it rained? See, with me, when it rains with a funeral, it reminds me that Jesus wept. And I think about it. Every time it rains at a funeral or right after a funeral that I've been to, Jesus wept. And the more that I have studied, Jesus wept. Jesus knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He's standing right there. He knew before time what he was going to do that day. He knew four days prior when he didn't get a hurry to go there, right? He already knew. But Jesus wept. One, the Bible reminds us and tells us he was fully human and fully God. And two, it tells me how much Jesus loved the brothers and sisters. Amen? And he wept. And then he said, Lazarus, come forth. Now, a lot of people say he called him by name because if he'd have called him anything else, a bunch of people would have come forth. And that might be true, but I would say there was probably more than one person named Lazarus during that century. But what I love about that was he knew him by name. The older I get, the more important it is to me when I study the Word to recognize how God knows who you are. And God calls you by name. And God knows all of your names. Does Jesus have more than one name? Yeah. Has Jesus had more, one, more than one name in your lifetime? Yes. Neasisi, Jehovah Jireh. Amen? My provider. So as we study this this morning, I want it to be very much personal. It has been to me this week. Very much personal, and I'm going to read you something, and this is from uh, the NLT. God's judgment must first begin with His own people, the ones who cannot claim ignorance as an excuse for sin. Now, how many of us have ever wanted, if you got stopped by a state trooper, did you ever want to claim innocence? Because the first thing I was stopped I've been, I've been stopped twice in my life, which is a blessing for real. I got stopped by a state trooper the day before my 40th birthday. And I was following our youth pastor, had a crew of kids, and we were going to Rainbow River. And the youth pastor was in front of me, and he had a group of kids. And I was behind him in my Voyager station wagon. And I had a crew of kids, and I was following him. And they had changed the speed limit out in Pedro from 55 to 45. And we didn't know it. They had just changed it. And Jason was driving faster, and I was following him. And the state trooper pulled Jason over. Well, Jason knew kind of where he was going, but he didn't know where we were going to stop. So I pulled off ahead of him, right, and waited on him. So the state trooper gave Jason a ticket. And then he pulled up by me and he said, do you know how fast you were going? I said, yes, sir. He said, how fast were you going? I said, 53 miles an hour. He said, what's the speed limit here? I said, 55 miles an hour. He said, the speed limit here is 45. I said, when did it change? Last week. Hadn't been there through since last week. And I said, I'm so sorry. One of the kids, and he left and took my driver's license, One of the kids that was in the car said, Miss Jeannie, why didn't you just keep your mouth shut? And I said, about what? He said, why didn't you pretend like you didn't know what the speed limit was? I said, because I thought I did know what the speed limit was. He said, yeah, 
but you always plead innocent. He said, you're innocent, Machini, till they prove you guilty. <laughs> he gave me a huge ticket. He gave Jason a huge ticket. I felt like I had to pay them both. So we got home, and I told Ted <laughs> that I'd gotten his ticket, and I was going to have to pay Jason's too. And Theodore Davis looked at me and said, Happy birthday to you. <laughs> and that was my birthday present that year for my 40th birthday, two speeding tickets. But I'm going to tell you something. Those kids, we talked about that experience floating down the Rainbow River. We were on tubes. We talked about it all day. It kept coming back, and it kept coming back, and it kept coming back. Because those kids needed to learn the lesson. You're guilty if you're guilty. You're guilty if you're guilty. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, preacher preaches all means all. So if all have sinned, guess what pot that puts us in? 1 Peter 4, 17. For the time has come for judgment, and it must begin with God's household. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news? For the time has come for judgment, and it must begin with the house of God. How many of you watched the Olympic opening? See, Ted and I don't have regular TV anymore, and so we, we weren't even trying to watch it. But my phone started blowing up. My phone, I said, Ted, I don't know what in the world. My phone was blowing up. Jenny, did you see this? Did you see this? Do you know what's going on? For any of you in the room that do not know what's going on, the, the Olympics in France, the opening was the most paganistic, horrible, sinful, awful thing that has ever been produced for television, in my opinion. Brazen... In your face, we hate Christians. In your face, we hate Christians. In your face. Now the question becomes, what do we do about that? See, the first thing that I read was a Catholic friend who said, the Pope better speak to this issue. That was, that was his first. That was his first comment. And as Christians in the Pentecostal church, a bunch of us would say the same thing. What's the head preacher going to do? The Holy Spirit speaks to us and says, what are you going to do? What is your place in all of this? Judgment begins with the house of God. God speaks to us as individuals. Amen? God tells us what the community should do, what the nation should do, what the community should do, what the church should do. But you know where it drills down to? Same thing Ted said to me. What are you going to do? Happy birthday to you. What are you going to do? What difference does it make in your life? How are you speaking out? Pastor preached a couple Sundays ago about he prayed and asked God to send somebody to his unsaved daddy. God, please send somebody to my unsaved daddy who lives in another place and share Jesus with him. And he said, God immediately said to him, whose daddy are you speaking to? Amen? It's like the lady that came to church and told me she didn't like the bathroom walls. She thought they were ugly and she didn't like them. And, and why are they in there? And I said, honey, you can paint them any color you want to paint them. Right? Right? Somebody came the other day and said, there's no toilet paper in the bathroom. I said, it's under the counter. I mean, I, I wasn't trying to be ugly. But this isn't somebody else's church. This is our church. And if the floor's dirty, sweep it. And if there's somebody up there praying, go pray with them. And if there's somebody crying in a pew, you don't, people, you don't have to say a word. I have learned from a very quiet man that words are not necessary. Being there, just standing next to somebody, just letting them know they're not by themselves. When you're at the altar and you're praying and you feel that everybody has left and they've gone on with their life, 
Do you know what it means to know that there's another person standing there with you, even if you don't know who they are? That you're not alone? It makes a difference. It makes a difference. Don't raise your hand. But some of you in here have gone in a, in a diner or a restaurant and seen somebody sitting by themselves, and you've gone and you've just ministered to them. And sometimes you get rebuffed. Hey, you want company? No. Okie doke. That's all you have to say. You know, sorry about your luck. No. <laughs> Be there for somebody else. Put yourself out there. Go to Isaiah uh, Psalms 50. The Lord, the Mighty One, is God. And He has spoken. He has summoned all humanity from where the sun rises to where it sets. Now, I don't know about you, but my daddy, every once in a while, would have family meetings. None of us liked them. There were six kids born in nine years, and when Daddy called a family meeting, it usually was not a happy thing. It was usually, all right, troops, we're going to tighten up around here. Now, every once in a while, it would be for something good. One time, Daddy called us all together and said, we don't have much money, but we're going to rent a car, because we didn't have a car that was very good, we're going to rent a car and we're going to drive and we're going to go on vacation and we're just going to go as many days till the money runs out and then we're going home. It was one of the best vacations we ever had. Eight of us in a Fury 3. We went till the money ran out and we drove straight home. We had a blast. But sometimes when Daddy called us together, it was, you're going to tighten up. You're going to do what your mama says. You're going to do bah, 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 right? Well, God called them all together. He called us all together and this is what he's saying he has summoned all humanity from where the sun rises to where it sets from mount zion the perfection of beauty god shines in glorious radiance our god approaches and he is not what he's not silent he's been silent for a while but he's not silent people sometimes when god is silent we think that's a good thing I got away with it. See, I'm sitting there feeling sorry for Jason because he got a ticket, right? Sirens behind me, lights are flashing. I'm looking in my rear view mirror. I'm feeling really bad that Jason's getting a ticket. But then the state trooper, <laughs> one of the kids said, drive on, Miss Jeannie, just go, right? I'm getting all of this teenage help. Just leave him. Just go somewhere. Just get away. Just leave him. How many of us have used other people as justification for our sin? I did it. I got away with it. Only one person saw it. Only one person knows about it. I'm scot-free. You did it, and then your conscience didn't jump right on you, so you're like, must not have been so bad. You did it, and you saw a preacher on TV doing it. Oh, it must be okay. You did it because somebody in the church you know is doing it, and nobody's saying anything. See, silence does not mean approval. Did you hear me? Silence does not mean approval. So God had been silent for quite some time. But now it said our God approaches and He is not silent. Fire devours everything in His way and a great storm rages around Him. Does that sound like mild-mannered Kent? Uh-uh. No. He calls on the heavens above and earth below to witness the judgment of His people. Now remember the scripture we read a while back where it says the whole earth is groaning for Jesus to come back? The earth is groaning. How many of you saw all the earthquakes this week? Texas having earthquakes. Places having earthquakes. Big earthquakes. Tremors that they can feel in the stores. Things that are going on just right around us. The Bible tells us that the earth is calling out itself for the Creator. So it says, He calls on the heavens above and earth below to witness the judgment of His people. Now, one of the people that texted me didn't think I would see the pictures of the Olympics, so they sent me three pictures. And the first picture that I saw made me want to throw up. The one that, that all the people are up there pretending like they're at the Last Supper. I mean, any Christian knew without being told, when you saw that picture, you knew what that was representing. You knew the mockery that was going on. Your spirit 
bore witness to the mockery of that. In the middle of all of that, I got a text that the Neelan family, and some say Nellan and some say Neelan, had been killed. And they had been to our church and our singing group. Sarah, when were they here? I, last summer. I couldn't remember exactly uh, when they were here. But they were going to um, Washington State to meet up with a Gaither group to go on a Gaither cruise. And the one daughter had flown separate, and the mama, the daddy, the one daughter, the husband, uh, and three more people were on the plane. And they crashed and were all killed. And so I'm getting all of this at one time. And in the middle of all that, it pops up because I have this thing on my phone now that's telling me about earthquakes. And it popped up and all this is going on at one time. Would you say I was being flooded? Yeah, you're being flooded. Some of y'all have had floods this week. The closer you come to Jesus Christ, the closer in, the more you press in, the more you press in, Satan attacks more. Amen? Why are you surprised when the enemy counterattacks? This horrible thing that happened in Israel yesterday where they bombed the Druids. We were in the town of Druids. They're not Jews. They are the most precious, kind, and loving people that we met. They live in Israel, and they are peaceful people. The ones that we met were such peaceful people. And their kids are playing soccer. And the bomb shelter is literally right here. They were five steps from the bomb shelter. But the siren that went off was too short. And they were running, but they didn't get in. They didn't get in. Immediately, I thought about the signs of the times. Jesus has told us. Jesus has told us the whole story. Y'all, we're the most blessed people that ever lived. I don't just have the book of Genesis. When Paul told Timothy, when he told Timothy to study, he was telling Timothy to study Old Testament. Timothy didn't get to go and hear the rest of the story. Amen? He was living it in lifetime. He didn't get to go and, and know how it all turned out. He didn't have the book of Revelation. You have the book of Revelation. And the Bible tells you that you are blessed if you'll read the book of Revelation. People run from the book of Revelation. They don't want to read it. People don't want to read what Jesus has to say to the churches because we don't want to be one of those churches. Amen? But how can you be prepared if you're not preparing that's my question this morning. You can't hide your head in the... You can't eat, overeat, and expect to get up skinny. You can't be prepared for the second coming of Jesus Christ if your soul and spirit is not prepared. You can say, Lord, I meant to get ready. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll eat cake today because it's my birthday, and I'm probably going to. I'll start tomorrow. You know that song, If Tomorrow Never Comes? Today is the day of salvation. And this is what God is saying in Psalms for us. The book of Psalms is an old book. But the Bible says that today He will separate, using the Word of God, the soul and the spirit. He will speak into your life and into your heart. It is new and fresh every morning. This might have been written this morning. And it says, Bring my faithful people to me, those who made a covenant with me by giving sacrifices. Did the Jewish people make a covenant with God? Four of them. They made covenants. Remember when Abraham took the, the, the animals and God came down between them? They made covenant. We've studied that. They made covenant. We've made a covenant. When you take communion, please, please, if you, have to, if you have to separate yourself, if you have to go in another room at the church, I tell people all the time, there are rooms behind where, where the platform is. There's rooms in the back. You never go back there. There's rooms back there. If you have to separate yourself from the body of Christ, God forbid, but if you do, go somewhere and get quiet with the Lord 
Do not take communion lightly. Do not take communion lightly. Take it with a seriousness of heart. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you because the Holy Spirit has never failed me about communion. Anytime I've ever taken the communion, the Holy Spirit has spoken to me about something that He wants different in my life. Now, He doesn't beat me with a stick. The Holy Spirit just speaks to me and, and woos me in love, do this better this week as, a, as an undergirding, as a reaching up. Please take the communion seriously. Please spend time with God saying, Lord, this I take seriously. You said you wouldn't do this again until you're with us. This I take seriously. And let the Holy Spirit do special things in your life. So it's bring my faithful people to me, those who made a covenant with me by giving sacrifices. Then let the heavens proclaim His justice, for God Himself will be the what? God Himself will be the judge. Now, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 33, 11. As surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of wicked people. I only want them to turn from their wicked ways so they can live. Turn, turn from your wickedness, O people of Israel. Why should you die? I take no pleasure. I take no pleasure in the death of evil. Decked wicked ones. God does not want you to go to hell. God did not make hell for people. Who did God make hell for? Yes. I watched this thing as all this was coming in yesterday. I don't know why my phone does some of the things it does. It's AI jumping all over the place. I bet Meta has a fun time on my phone. But in the middle of all this, this thing came up about the Euphrates drying up. And it was talking about the Euphrates drying up. And somehow it went from the Euphrates drying up to the four angels, uh, demon angels that are buried and supposedly underneath uh, the river of Euphrates. Well, that was a rabbit trail for me yesterday, and I didn't have time to trail it. So some of y'all rabbit trail that. That would be fun. Look, look that up and, and rabbit trail that about Euphrates. But the thing that got to me about that was the Euphrates on top. The people are suffering because the Euphrates is drying up because it affects like eight countries wherever Euphrates affects eight countries. So the people in real time that are on the earth are struggling and dying from that water drying up, not seeing or understanding the spiritual connotation of the river Euphrates drying up. We fight not against flesh and blood. The warfare is not between people. The Middle East is fighting. I don't know how I didn't understand it, but I did not understand that Israel was the size of New Jersey. Now, I've only been in a little bit of New Jersey, so I haven't seen the whole state of New Jersey, just the closer to New York side, but that's not a big state. And so you have to wonder why through the centuries has this little place that's the size of New Jersey been the world center of history? How does that even make any sense? Why wouldn't these big countries just move on, right? Why is this such a thing? Well, it is because in Genesis, God spoke. And that's His place. And that's His people. And so if you're studying, if you're going through your Christian experience and you're wondering about these things, all you have to do is study the history of Jews to know that God says what He says and means what He says. Amen? He's God and we're not. And so all these things that are taking place are coming to a what? They're coming to a head. They're coming to a head. Now, I know it's gross, but if you ever had a boil on your body and you suffered with that boil very long, you were grateful when it came to a head. And you were grateful when the pressure was applied and the poison was destroyed. How do people think that our God, who told us the whole story, who told us, who sent His Son to die, the most perfect sacrifice that there could have ever been, He sent His Son to die, and yet people still do not what? Believe. Laid back and do not believe. We have the whole Bible. 
the whole book, and yet we don't read it. We have the whole story. Some of you have new cars, and some of you do not read your owner's manual, and some of you will be five years from now finding out something that your fancy new car does that you don't have a clue it does. I know that to be true, because I had a friend who had a car, and I rode with her to lunch one day, and it was cold outside, and she was in a Ford, and I knew something about Fords, and it was cold, and I reached over and flipped the switch so that my seat would warm up. She didn't know her car had seat warmers. And I laughed at her, and I said, did you even read your manual? Nope. How foolish are we to trust somebody else with our soul because we don't read the manual? The Bible says the Holy Spirit will teach you what? All things. So if you study, the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. You come from a different place in your life than I do. We're all at different places. I brought my old poetry book. I'm going to read you a poem as we close. I'm going to read you a poem in my old book. I had to have Ted Google it to see what year it was because it's Roman numerals. This book was written in 1933. It costs 50 cents new. It's been in my family, uh, my granny, my mother, and now me. So it doesn't smell too great. It makes my nose run when I read it. But it's got some precious old poems in it. You know why I love these old precious books so much? Because they're teaching me. Because these people were ahead of me on the road. Amen? They're ahead of us on the road. They are telling us, Narrow spot coming, watch your head, water on the ground, lights out, right? Have y'all ever been caving? When we went on vacation in the mountains, we went to a cave. I think it was Luray, not sure. Uh, we went to the caves. I had to stay in the back because I was the slowest once with all the grandchildren. But what my grandchildren did as we got to certain spots, they were going ahead and they were having a good time. But every once in a while, one of my grandchildren, not always the same one, would drop back and say, Gigi, it's short. It's, it's hanging down low up here. Be careful. you got to what? Duck your head. One time, there was a big thing of water that you couldn't get around. And my youngest grand came back and he said, Gigi, you're going to have to watch me, Gigi. You're going to have to turn and you'll have to go sideways like this. And I stood and looked and all these young people ahead of me, ahead of me, did you hear me? Ahead of me, telling me how to go. Well, all these old books and all these testaments, all these preachers, all these wonderful people that have gone before us have left us cookies on the trail. Amen? For our edification, for our uplifting to remind us, come on, come on, you can make it. You can make it. So I want to read you this This. It's short, it's not very long, but it so is speaking to my heart. It's called, None of Self and All of Thee. None of Self. Oh, the bitter shame and sorrow that a time could ever be when I let the Savior's pity plead in vain and proudly answered, All of Self and None of Thee. Yet He found me, I beheld Him. Bleeding on the accursed tree, heard him pray, forgive him, Father. And my wistful heart said faintly, some of self and some of thee. Day by day, his tender mercy, healing, helping, full and free, sweet and strong and oh so patient, brought me lower while I whispered less of self and more of thee. Higher than the highest heavens, deeper than the deepest sea. Lord, thy love at last has conquered. Grant me now my soul's desire, none of self and all of thee. Isn't that something? That is something, y'all. That is something. So what that poem tells me, don't be discouraged by where you're at. Some of us, it's taken to this birthday to get to this place 
where we can truly say, truly say, all. Don't beat yourself up. I don't know which stanza of this poem you're at this morning. All of me, some of me, part of me, none of me. But wherever you're at on that road this morning, God loves you and God cares. And God wanted you to hear this message of Psalms 50 because we're going to read it before we leave here and we're going to be late and I'm going to get fired. Oh, my people, listen as I speak. Here are my charges against you, O Israel. I am God, your God. I have no complaint about your sacrifices or the burnt offerings you constantly offer. But I do not need the bulls from your barns or the goats from your pens. For all the animals of the forest are mine, and I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird on the mountains. Did he know where the Neelands were yesterday? Yes, he loved them more. I know every bird on the mountain and all the animals of the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for all the world is mine and everything in it. Do I eat the bull meat of bulls? Do I drink the blood of goats? Make thankfulness your sacrifice to God and keep the vows you made to the Most High. Then call on me when you are in trouble and I will rescue you and give you my glory. Does he know where you're at this morning? You didn't know you were going to be in Oxford, Florida this morning, but God did. You didn't know you were going to be with this group of people this morning, but God did. You didn't know what passage we were going to study this morning, but God did. You didn't know how the Holy Spirit was going to deal with your spirit this morning, but God did. That's how much He loves us. That's how much He loves us because He wants us to win. Did you hear me? He wants us to win. I'm going to close with this. I saw this race this week. I love races. And since I've been studying races and all of that, they pop up. And I saw this race and it was a group of mothers and they had their four-year-old children and they were at a school and there was a race and at the other end there were people with pom-poms and they were cheering the four-year-olds to come to them. Come to them. Come to them. And they blew the horn and the kids started off. And one kid just stood there, frozen in his tracks. And his mama ran and grabbed him and she picked him up and she ran with him. Bless her heart. She wasn't the skinniest person on the track. And she ran with him. And she got all the way down and then she put him down and she let him finish the race. And they were talking about a mother's love and what a mother will do for her child. And I could just see Jesus. When we're down and we're out and we think it's all over and we see horrible things like this, what's going on in France and what's going on all over the world and all this hatred and we see all this and we get frozen in place and it's like, I can't run the race anymore. I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to hide my head in the sand. I want to close my doors. I want to stay at my house and pretend like it all does not exist. But Jesus told us to work. He told us to work. So you have to get out and you have to do and you have to keep going. But the beauty of this is when you get stuck, Jesus sees that you're stuck. He runs up. He picks you up. He carries you, right? He carries you in his arms. He carries you. And then just at the right moment, he puts you down and he says, keep running, my child. How do I know that? I know that because the Bible says when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. He went and he's ever interceding at the right hand of the Father because he calls you by name. Father, I thank you for this lesson this morning. Father, help us to run this race. Father, help us to take off everything, everything, Father, that's slowing us down. Father, help us to run this race in love with joy in our hearts. Father, with gratitude that you chose us to run this race. Father, not only we are anointed by your Holy Spirit, but we are appointed to run this race. Father, 
to be encouraged by those in front of us, to be taught by those in front of us, and Father, to be the lifter of the head of those who are behind us, who are discouraged. Father, help us to be the person in their life. Use us. Father, use what we've got in our hands for the grace of others. And Father, let your Holy Spirit put this lesson in our hearts. Let us hear it in the morning. Let us acknowledge it as we go to bed that, Father, you want us to win. For, Father, you said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Lord Jesus, in our ignorance, teach us. Father, in the areas of our life that we have not understood, teach us. Father, as we study these psalms, these ancient songs of old, teach us because you promised that your word would be new to us every morning. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Thank you all. On behalf of our pastor and staff here at OAG, we want to say thank you. Thank you for being a part of our ministry. We are grateful for you and the support you give our church and its ministries so that we can continue to do what God has called us to do, to be the family church for the family of God. For more content from Pastor Strickland and Oxford Assembly of God, check out our media website at oag.church/media.